Is that when you honor others, God will honor you. Amen. So in the measure you honor others, let it be in the measure that you want to be honored. So I would appreciate you come on time and excited and ready to celebrate with us. I know you will, but you know it's good sometimes to just talk about a few things. Amen. And so let's come ready to honor. Let's come on time. Come a little early, you know. If nothing's started yet, then you, you'll have a little bit of time to pray for this place and pray for us and all of us together. Amen? So come a little early, and, and we'll do a little ding reminder to, <laughs> to let you know and not to forget. Amen? Well, I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to hop over into something, and then we're going to hop over to something else. And we're, gonna, we're going to just kind of talk about the life of honor. Something happened to me a couple services ago, and the Lord was stirring me about honor. And I've already said this to you, what you honor will increase. What you honor will increase. If you want to see increase in any area of your life, honor it. Honor that, that particular thing. You know, if you honor the Lord as Jehovah Jireh, my provider, you'll begin to see provision. How many of you have watched that happen? Well, thank you both. How many of you have watched that happen? When you recognize him, I remember several years ago, I began to feed, just kind of meditate on my God shall supply all of my needs. And you know what? He showed out as Jehovah Jireh. I had two vehicles break down at the same exact time. How many vehicles you have? Two. <laughs> All right. So that was a little problem. <laughs> but I had already been recognizing. He had actually already led me into that passage of Scripture and was feeding on it. And, stuff. and so when it, the things happened to me, I didn't freak out. I didn't like, oh, God, what are we going to do? You know, I, was, I, I began to just really... Uh, speak from my heart. And, and, and I called those bills paid in full, and God paid off all the bills. One, one mechanic took so long on one of my vehicles, he told me Merry Christmas and gave me my vehicle back. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, either way, the things that happened to me turn out for the funds of the gospel, right, Josh? It's that you don't know all the things that are going to happen to you, and God didn't say all of them were good. See, we would choose everything that doesn't develop us at all. We would choose the path of least resistance. There is none of, none of you that would say, yes, trial and tribulation, serve, serve me up, extra helping. No, you wouldn't choose trial. You wouldn't choose tribulation. You wouldn't choose pain. You wouldn't choose suffering. But listen, all those things are to build you. James told us this. He said, listen, let the testing of your faith have patience. Let patience have its perfect work. All right? Let your faith be tested that you could be perfect and entire one nothing. Maturity doesn't come through going through nothing. Maturity comes through going through the fire. Maturity, you think about the, 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 the potter, he forms that vessel, right? To be this, this beautiful vessel, but the vessel will hold nothing unless it goes through the fire. There is a tempering process that makes that container valuable and useful. For its intended design. And God has an intention and a design for you. And he knows the fire necessary to make you the container that he has purposed you for. Well, thank you both. I'm telling you, there's something happening in the spirit today. It's time to wake, awake to righteousness. God needs you to awaken to his way of being and doing. And we've established something. And one of the things we've established is that righteousness is, is a right standing before God. We know that. How many of you heard me talk about righteousness? Just a little bit, you know. But righteousness is also God's way of being and doing. God actually has a way of being and doing. One of the scriptures in the word of God that I like, it says he did not seek them in the, they did not seek him in the way that he had ordained. He was talking about how that when they were wanting to go, go after the presence, David had a heart to go after it, but he didn't have an understanding of how to carry it. And we want to go after the presence of God, but we have to have an understanding of how to carry it, how to host the presence of God. And one of the things is we have to be a place of honor. We have to be a place of value. And one of the things the Lord put on my heart today, I hadn't heard him talk about this before, but he said revelation is spiritual value. Revelation actually gives spiritual value. Okay? And so it takes the Holy Spirit to give you eyes to see. It takes the Holy Spirit the, 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 it, to, to give you revelation knowledge. And then you will have spiritual value. So we need to pray and say, God, give us the spirit of wisdom. Give us revelation. Ask him for revelation. Because right now, you cannot create spiritual value in people. Somebody's going to help me today. You cannot do it. With your own strength, how many of you get irritated and frustrated? Stuff is trying to frustrate me this morning and stuff like that. But the thing is, so you know what we do? We just shift and go give glory to God. We just 
this hectic shift because listen, your kids are going to do crazy stuff. Your spouse is going to do crazy stuff. There's people at work that are going to go nuts and you're going to be like, what am I working with? These people are crazy. In life, there's going to be stuff that happens. Are you going to be that little frog that mom talked about that they popped the BB and popped the BB and popped the BB and then you just suck all this heavy stuff up and eventually the frog could no longer hop because it was every little BB, every little fence, every little irritation, every little distraction. The enemy will give you a whole slew of distractions. We try to be still in the presence of God in this place, and we try to focus on the Lord, and then, oh, you know, this and that and the other to distract. And so you either in that moment, you either let that be a... and be a BB that weighs you down, or you just, hey, know how to shift back over again. And then eventually the devil understands he's going to keep shifting. He's going to keep looking back, looking back at Jesus. He's not going to, he's not going to let their, their attitude be his attitude. He's not going to let their dysfunction be his. He's going to just keep putting his eye back on Jesus. You may come and try to grab my attention, but I'm going to keep turning it back up to Jesus. You may come and try to be a distraction, but I'm going to keep turning it up to Jesus. Things happen to you. They do. They did. They have. They will. <laughs> Thank you. They do, they did, they have, they will. And it's not that something never happens to you. And I've got the victory because nothing ever. We, had, we, grew, we came from a background of people that are talking faith, talking faith, talking faith. And sometimes I don't know if they meant it or not, but it's almost like if I have a lot of money, I've got faith. If I have a wonderful, glorious time and everybody can see how wonderful everything is for me, then I must really know God and I have faith and I'm a spiritual giant. Listen, there, Paul went through hell. What kind of faith did he have? He got chains, he got beatings, he had stonings, he got kicked out of places, and he'd go back in and do it again. Get kicked out again. Let me tell you, he went through it. So if he was determining everything in his life by ease and lots of money and lots of wonderful, pleasant things, then he definitely wasn't in the will of God. But listen, I found out when you're in the will of God, stuff happens. But sure, there's something that happens within you that's greater than what's happening outside of you. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I'm a world overcomer. I overcome by the blood of the Lamb. How do we overcome? By looking at what we're doing and not doing and how awesome we've been? No, we look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is our example, and the Bible says that Jesus is our example. He endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy of you. See, unless the seed fell into the ground and died, there would be no fruit. Jesus was the seed of the church. Jesus was the seed that had to be planted, that had to die for the harvest of the church. You are the product, you are the fruit of Jesus, that righteous seed. And as he is, so are we now in this world. And actually that translates as, as he now is. Not as broken and even on the cross, but he's in glory. And the Bible says we're seated together with him in heaven. See, you need to come to Revelation. Listen, you need to go listen to that online. I'm telling you, you don't even know what you're missing. Because I'm saying you've got to go over it. No, I'm going to go over it. I got over it. I was getting like grabbed on the, I was driving and watching that on live stream and stuff. I, I couldn't get here in time, so I said, I'm putting that on. Why? Because there's value. And what you value, what you honor will increase. And so listen, if you can honor other people when they're preaching, God will raise you up and preach through you. But he's not going to raise you up when you can't honor the other people. <laughs> Why do we have to pray for Guatemala? If you'll pray for Guatemala, he'll touch your house. But don't you expect him to touch your house if you can't weep and cry for Guatemala. God says, I'm raising up a church in this house that's going to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Everyone in this room is ready to give your life for something. You have this innate desire in you to live for something beyond you, beyond yourself, beyond us four, not more. Why do we get miserable when we're self-centered instead of Jesus-centered? The gospel is not your best life now. The gospel is Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that lives in me. And see, that's the reason that there's an issue with us priding ourselves on serving our own desires. And some people aren't going to like this, but I can tell you from experience that serving our own desires will make us hellacious lives. The root of sin is idolatry. 
It's idolatry. Homosexuality is idolatry. Fornication, adultery is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. Greed is idolatry. At the root, at the base of the thing, is that we have now fashioned a God that we are worshiping before Him. That was too few claps. We now have a God that we fashioned and are worshiping before Him. God never made us to serve our own desires because, listen, the flesh will never be satisfied. I'm telling you, it will never be satisfied. See, I deal with the same devil you deal with that tries to deceive and to kill and to steal and destroy me. He wants to pervert our minds. He wants to deceive our lives. He wants us to be self-seeking and touchy and fretful and resentful. But love is the total opposite of that. Love pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Love does not insist in our own rights and our own way. Love says, Lord, show me your way that I would know you. There is a path to righteousness and the Lord has laid it out and he's laid it out and it's precious word. We got to get back to the psalmist. What the psalmist said. He says, "The word, your word, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. My God, how do you know which way to go unless you get under the lamp? Unless you get under the light? Unless you have revelation knowledge?" That's why Paul said it. He outlined in Ephesians. We're going to read it a thousand times, Kelly, over and over and over. Give us the spirit of wisdom. Give us the revelation, the knowledge of you. We're not just learning the Bible. We need the revelation knowledge of who you are because they've told us a lot of things that aren't you. I've been in church for 40 years. You think I'd be excited, but that might not be a good thing. Some of you have told you every Sunday, we'll keep telling you, <laughs> is you'd be better off at Cracker Bell sometimes in some churches. Because they didn't give you the revelation knowledge of Jesus. They gave you the, revel the, 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 the commandments of men. Trying to get us to do something that we don't have revelation light on. And I can tell you to do it, and I can tell you to live it, and I can tell you to make you feel bad because you're not. But until the light comes, you can't see anything different. And this church needs the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, you seek me, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. This church needs a value for the Word of God, a value for the Spirit of God. Like Moses, he said, if your presence doesn't go with me, I'm not going anywhere. You say we're blessed, you're saying we're your people. Well, God, if we're your people, you got to go with us. Otherwise, we're not any different than anybody else. See, a life of honor looks like a life of His presence. A life of honor looks like waiting on the Lord. What could be more honorable than waiting on the Lord? We read the passage last week, and I'm going to probably read it a thousand times, two or more. But you know, you know about Mary and sitting in his feet. She chose that part that couldn't be taken away from her. But the greatest honor was that she would wait on him. But Mary was doing a work for him. I got to feed Jesus. But Mary's like, I got to feed on Jesus. I got to work for Jesus, but Mary said, I got to worship Jesus. I got to sit at his feet. What's the higher priority? What's, the, what's, the, what's Jesus wanting? He liked what Mary did, so I think we ought to look at what she did, right? I, thought, I think we ought to put that first because he said, this part's not going to be taken away from you. Matter of fact, wherever this gospel's preached, I'm going to have them preaching of what Mary did because there is a secret in the waiting. There is a secret in the being still and knowing he's God. We're not in that big of a rush to wait to hear him speak. When you get in a rush, look at me, eyeballs on me. <laughs> One, two, three, eyes on me. <laughs> I bind that fourth grade teacher thing coming on. Let me tell you, there's value in the waiting. When you rush, you get messed up. When I rush, I get messed up. You know, I read one of those fun scriptures, Sister Alma, this week in Proverbs. It says, when you isolate yourself, you seek your own way. That's another reason we're gathering together because, listen, on your own, you get eaten like that animal on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> All by myself. <laughs> your lunch. Yeah, we're figuring it out. We are figuring it out. You're like, I'm strong. I can do this. And out you go. And they're, oh. 
Because the devil's seeking to devour you. And he says, I know if I can get him away from his brothers. I know if I can get, him or get her away from her sisters. I know if I can get her away from the church. If I can get her away from the word. If I can get her away from the presence of God. If I can get her distracted and busy about a lot of stuff. I've seen well-meaning people that love God. They get busy wanting to have things they've never had before. And it started out an okay thing. But then it became an idolatrous thing. And now they're not even serving God, living for God. Their marriage got divorced. All this other crazy hell happened. Because why? They got off of Jesus. They got out of his presence. Instead of waiting before the Lord for the distraction, for the, the strategy, instead of waiting on the Lord for his choice for your life, I know what it is. I can talk about this because I've done it. How many have gotten busy and picked your person? How many have gotten busy and picked your car? How many have gotten busy and picked your plan? I've had some good plans and they turned out terrible, Heather. I mean, I can, they, I can tell you so much about what I've done that was stupid. And how I've had to eat the fruit of my own way. How I many could tell some tales? <laughs> but we're not here to talk about it. We're here to talk about Jesus. Amen. And he's the one that will bring you out of it all. But there's an R word that we don't hear in church a lot today. And it's repent for the kingdom of God is here. Amen. Repent. Change the way you think to accept the will of God. In other words, God has a way. He has a path of righteousness. And he's waiting on you to say, hey, no more my plans. No more my ideas. No more what I came up with. No more of our cool productions. Only your way. Show me. I don't need anything else. I don't need anybody else. And when you get to that place where you don't have a will, you will know God's will. Because I want to know God's will. But you're asking everybody else. <laughs> I want to know God's will. But you're running to and fro trying to find it. And God's will is peace. God's will, Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of God be the umpire that settles all the questions that arise in your mind. It doesn't mean you're not going to have stuff hit your mind, but it doesn't have to hit your heart. Amen. You're not in unbelief when it hits your head. You're in unbelief when you let that thing get in your heart. It's one thing for a bird to fly over. It's another thing for it to make a nest in your hair. Somebody's going to help me preach today. This is not about a flyover. This is not even about a poop drop. This is about you letting something consistently rest on your head and make a nest and affect what you do and say and where you go. I'm talking to a church today that's ready to arise and shine for the light has come and the glory of the Lord is arisen upon us. Nobody's perfect, but I feel a holy thing up in this house today. I feel the Spirit of God awakening something deep in you. See, you can't even have fire without the Holy Ghost. You can't even desire God without God giving you the desire. What do we do, Josh? Throw ourselves on the Lord. You know what the Bible says? Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Are y'all here? All my stuff's getting worked out. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Turn and say, slow down. Don't get in a hurry. Don't get in a rush. God's doing something holy. And in holiness, you're still. In the holiness of the Lord, you're still and you know he's God. You're still and you know he's God. We get anxious when we get too busy. But I've got a lot to do. But guess what? You can carry him into everything you have to do. You can be aware. See, first it's your attention, then then you have an awareness. But first, the Bible talks about, can I just preach from the scriptures that come to my heart? First, Moses, he's like, of course, <laughs> good, I'm in the right church. Okay, anyway, you first, Moses, when God appeared to Moses, you remember the burning bush? One of the things that Moses did is he looked again. He saw something burning. <laughs> But then his head turned to look again. And the Bible says, when the Lord saw him look again, he said he began to speak to him. You see, you can just look and go on by. But when you intentionally turn again to look at him, and you turn again, and again, and again, the Lord begins to speak to you because what you honor, you value. This must be important. And so when we put an importance on his speaking, an importance on his word, then he begins to speak. Because listen, he doesn't cast his pearl before swines. He doesn't cast his pearl before swine, right? Because why? Swine would trample a pearl. They don't know the difference between a pearl and a piece of poop. They'll rub in it all. They'll eat it all. 
and you'll eat them. Okay, no, no. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. We'll come over here. <laughs> and one girl's like, no, I don't eat that. <laughs> I know what they do with it. Okay, anyway. I see what they take out of them restaurants for the pigs to eat, okay? <laughs> they don't know the difference between poop and pearls. They value both of them equally. They'll probably try to eat both, right? They don't care. Edible, unedible. The Bible says you can be a vessel of honor or you can be a vessel for common uses. Because if you want to be a vessel of honor, pursue the, you're going to pursue certain things. Philippians talks about Philippians talks about some people. He said that, you know, that their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. But all that didn't start it. They set their mind on earthly things. It didn't start with, sign, up, sign me up for destruction. It started with, I got distracted. The enemy never has to plan your destruction if he just can to plan your distraction. He just wants to get us too busy, independent. See, America emphasizes, we live in a nation that I think it's more challenging to serve God in this nation than it is China. China, the Chinese people are praying for America, not the other way around. We don't want to be like you, America. Talks about they don't even deal with some, they, they talk about we don't have some of the, the, the sexual promiscuity and some of that in the church, in the Chinese church. It's not an issue. They have a whole different context of what the gospel is. And so they don't struggle in some of the ways the American church struggles. We are in a place of overload, overstimulation. The enemy has been able to suck us into every little, every little device and every little social media platform. We are so distracted. He's like, I got, I got these people on autopilot. Y'all are getting quiet now. It's the truth. It's happened to me and it's happened to you. The enemy doesn't have to do much. We talk about the devil doing this and the devil doing this. The devil's got people on autopilot, honey. Sometimes you hear people talk, you'd like to think that the devil is personally working in their life, that he has time for just them alone. He doesn't have to do that with you. He's got people on, he's got the church on autopilot. He's got us hooked to our devices and our plans and our agendas and our comfort zones. And we still think everything's all right. Jesus is coming. And it's all good. And you think, well, it happened to save by grace. I know it's right over here in my notes. <laughs> I haven't read it yet. <laughs> I was going to, I was going to start out with that. Save by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. You can write that scripture down. It'll make you feel better. Ephesians 2, 8, 2, 8 through 10. We are saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. But there comes a point. I don't know where Gil, G G Kelly, how it's almost called you Gilly. I don't know where Kelly's gift is. She had this gift on Wednesday night and stuff. And that gift, you know, is, uh, do you have that in here? Is it, is it even here? Leave your stuff here. No, you gave it away. Okay. So listen, you don't get that pretty shiny gift today. You get this Kleenex box. So, you know, this gift, it is the gift of God. But listen, you can choose to ignore the gift. You can choose to never take advantage of the gift. You can undervalue. It can sit in your house forever and you never use it. And we say, but I'm saved and I got the gift. But what good is the gift to you? What are we doing with it? If you undervalue the gift of God, which is righteousness by faith in Christ Jesus... See, having the gift of God, which is righteousness. The Bible says in Romans 3, you can put it up there if you want to, verse 23. Is, I didn't go to Exodus, I know. Romans 3, look at this real quick. Y'all okay? I don't know what time it is. I'm just telling you, you got to see this. Value. What you value will increase. What you honor will increase. We got to value. I can't value something if I don't spend time with it. I can't value something if I don't look at it. If you're going to value the work of the cross, you've got to look at the work of the cross. If you're going to value the blood of Jesus, you've got to look at the blood of Jesus. You've got to talk about the blood of Jesus. You've got to value the Holy Spirit, you have to talk to the Holy Spirit. He's in there. How many times has he been in there, Sister Liz? He's in there, but I don't acknowledge him. He's in there, but I don't become aware of him. I don't give him my attention. Say, Holy Spirit, it's a good day. Good morning, Holy Spirit. What do you have to do today? Last time I checked, Jesus was the leader and we were the followers. Jesus determines your way. Jesus, the Bible says in Psalms, I think it's one, he says the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked shall perish. 
The way of the wicked will be in in destruction, but that means there's a way of the righteous. Isn't there? If Psalms 1 says the Lord knows the way of the righteous, there's actually a way of the righteous. Turn in and say, neighbor, I don't make my own way in life. I seek the Lord for his way. See, everybody loves I'm in right standing with God and it's the gift of God. But listen, there's a point where you are expected to do something with the gift. You're expected to do something with this righteousness. You're expected to live as a light in the earth. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. God says we're no longer to even fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Peter said, hey, you got to understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you know it's your responsibility, church? It's my responsibility, church, to understand what the will of the Lord is. When you were sheriff, what if you stopped somebody and they were going 85 in a 45? And they said to you before you could say, officer, officer, I did not know it was 45. So I'm good, right? Bye, have a nice day. <laughs> you, oh, hey, whoa, hold on, wait a minute. You're getting a ticket. She said, and now he, I hear what he's saying right now. He said, I don't write tickets. I don't write tickets. Okay, deputy, work with me. <laughs> Would ignorance... Uh, ev uh, not evict, uh, exempt them from the law? I'll ask the, I ask the wrong guy in here. Does ignorance work? No. The law is the law. The word is the word. But if you're not exposed to it, you're not aware of it. And you will be subject to a lot of deception. In 2020, the Lord put on my heart, he said, listen, he said, you got to be a lover of truth or you're going to be swept away with deception. Right? There's some people that they still are gripped by fear because of what people told them. Why? They didn't have a foundation of truth. Did they? they didn't have a so when the, the shaking came, they fell. And some people never recovered. And some churches never recovered. There's still people online only. If they're even on. Because they were trying to be so relevant and so tending to everybody's needs. And the Lord has called us to sit at his feet. See, we can either be the church that tends to everybody's needs or the church that sits at his feet and then all the needs are met. And then you'll have the strategy, you'll have the direction, you'll have the answer for a hurt and dying world. But it doesn't come from going out and putting them first. It comes in coming and sitting before his feet and tending to him. That's the greatest thing that we can make our slogan, tend to him. Tend to him. And then a place of meeting, tend to him. A place of meeting, go after God. A place of meeting, ask him, Lord, show us your way that we would know you. Let's be a people of honor. Let's be a people of the presence that values God's presence. Because what you honor will increase. What you value, you will see in your life. The Bible says that those that honor me, I believe this is, this is uh, I'm trying to remember the reference real quick. Ecclesiastes, he says, by those who honor me, I will be regarded as holy. But by those that dishonor me, those that dishonor me will be lightly esteemed. So it's the people that honored him that had the proximity to him. You think about when Jesus walked on the earth, there was something about Peter, there was something about John, James, there was something about them that they were allowed a closer proximity to him than some of the other disciples. Judas didn't get the proximity to Jesus that uh, Peter did. What's the difference? Is Peter lo more loved by Jesus than Judas? No, Jesus loved Judas. I mean, if Jesus loved Judas to let him. Do you think Jesus didn't know he was dipping into the treasury? <laughs> he knew all that. He knew he was stealing from him. He's in the presence of Jesus and he's stealing. So just because we get away with it doesn't mean he doesn't know and doesn't mean he doesn't care. It's all right. It's fine. I'll come over here. I said, just because he doesn't, just because he allows it or he lets you feel like you're getting away with it doesn't mean he doesn't care. He cared. He knew what that was doing to Judas' heart. It put Judas in such a position to continue to do that in the presence of God. It put him in such a position that he had no problems going out and, and, and selling Jesus out. It matters what you do in the presence of God. You, your heart can be hardened. How many know that? 
So that's why when you come into worship, there's people today that when they come into worship, it's no big deal. I can talk, I can chew, I can, I can do something, I can find out what everybody did this week. All this, I'm telling you, all this can happen. And, and there's other people, and they're just there weeping in the presence of God. Just, oh, Lord, you're beautiful, you're faith. And, and then we've got a conversation going on. And there's a time for conversation. There's a time to visit and fellowship. But listen, when the presence of God is to be honored, listen, you want to be engaged. You don't want to miss his face because, listen, their, their face is not going to do for you what his face is going to do for you. You can't live on their face, but you can live on his face. All right. It's tight, but it's right. He says in Romans 3, um, is that the one I want? I don't even remember. Oh, I just was going to read you the scripture. It talks about those that receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through Christ Jesus. Come on, it's a gift. Somebody say, it's a gift. But we honor the gift. You know, Romans 5, 17 tells us, that's the verse I was looking for. It tells us it's the free gift of righteousness. Right standing with God is a free gift for you to receive. Not by your works, but by faith in Jesus. Amen? How many of you received that gift of righteousness? How many of you believe that gift of righteousness? How many of you talk about it, think about it, look at it, consider it? You ought to. I love how Kelly was bringing out imagination. How she says she's learned, you know, Pastor Glenn has talked about our imaginations. Your imagination is from God. The enemy wants to use it to think of all kinds of horrible things. But God wants you to use it to picture Jesus. And so she was talking about how I picture Jesus on the throne. <laughs> Turning and said, this is good for you. Because see, how many of you noticed ever, ever before, your imagination will take you into an experience. It doesn't start with, it, with, with, it starts in your head. Before you ever experience, there's people that they say, I don't know how we got here. Your imagination, your thinking, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so one of the ways that we live in our life of honor is that the, the, J- David said this, he said, I always put the Lord before me. On my bed at night, I lay and I think of you. I mean, that's purposeful. So you're going to set purposeful time because you want a life of honor. You want a life of just surrender to the Lord. So on purpose, God, I'm going to set time with you. On purpose, I'm going to spend with you. On purpose, I'm just going to sit there and I'm going to wait. I'm not going to keep giving you my prayer requests. The Bible says he knows everything you need before you, before you ask it. But do you know the devil would love you to spend the whole time on what you want and what you need? Listen, in his presence, you're going to find out, and I'm going to find out that what we want is not really what we need. There's a lot of things. I'm going to talk to my guy over here. There's a lot of things that I thought I wanted, and I'm like, thank God you didn't give that to me. I mean, would wave a hot hand in the air like you really do care. That's why the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Have you ever thought, you said, oh, I'm just craving this, and I just want this, and then you prepare it, you get it, you go get it, and you eat it, and you're like, eh. Have you been there? That was gross. That wasn't even that good. I've heard my mom before. She's like, let's get some chocolate. I mean, you know, you know my, my mom liked chocolate and stuff. I mean, she didn't have it all the time, but she liked chocolate. And she said, let's go get us some chocolate. And how many times, Dad, did we hear mom after we ate that? That wasn't any good. I didn't even need that. I didn't want that. Didn't even like it. <laughs> Don't look at me funny. I won't know it's you. So many times we think, man, this is going to fulfill me. But listen, God is greater than your own heart. He knows what will satisfy you. You may think you need this lady, but God says you don't even need anybody like that. You may say, no, this is the guy for me. We finish each other's finishes. But God knows his heart. You may say, hey, this is the job. This is the one I've been waiting for. And then that door goes, wham. God, where are you? Protecting you is where I am. (laughs) Shutting that hellish door so I can open a door and do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that you could ask or think. When is the church going to trust Jesus and wait on the Lord? The psalmist says, wait on the Lord, he'll renew your strength. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He's going to cause you to mount up on wings like eagles. And you're going to run and you're going to not be weary. You're going to walk and not be faint. You know, we came from a background where everybody's like, say something to it. Say something. Hope you say the thing Jesus is saying. Because a lot of times we got in a rush to just say something. Well, let me go get my scriptures on healing and throw it at it. 
Well, let me go get my scriptures on prosperity and throw it at it. You don't even need a relationship with the Holy Ghost for that. Because I've got this book, and I'm just going to use this book to get what I want. Listen, that's not a life in the Spirit. That's not the way of God. That's not the way of righteousness. The Bible says righteousness is peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And when God gives you a word, he gives you joy with it. When God gives you a word, there's peace that passes understanding and joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. Why could Peter get on the water and walk to Jesus? Because he didn't just get a word from a Bible. He got a word from Jesus' mouth himself. And Jesus is going to take this word and he's going to make it a living word to you. And you're going to be able to see the impossible thing become possible because you're going to live a life of honor. A life of waiting on the Lord. A life of waiting on Him to speak. I don't care if it takes one hour or 40 days or five years. I'm not moving till you move me. I'm not speaking till you speak to me. I'm not doing till you tell me. We've been, we've been, we've been coached by the world, though. Haven't we? Haven't we? Brother Hagin said, you know what? He said, we have three hot meals every day. We don't miss them. And then we come and we get one, you know, made probably cold snack a week on Sunday because that's our duty. And we expect to survive on that. And he said, there's no wonder. No wonder. Three hot meals, never miss them. There are things right now, I think we used to call it like a rock in your schedule. You wouldn't let that be disrupted. How many of you know you have honor for certain people? Wave your hand if you've got some honor for certain people in your life. There's things you've drawn a line over, and there will be nobody to disrupt it. We will see a side of you that we've never seen if somebody disrupts it. I'm telling you. One of my pet peeves, I told, told Lauren, is like, when you, when you tell, when, and I'm not, I, haven't been, I haven't been perfect on this, but there was something that this year, you know, there was a time that I had to be in a certain building. And I gave multiple speeches to my children about we will be there at this time. Because I am paid to do that. And I've got to be in there. And this isn't a revolve around just you. Because we got to be there. <laughs> we could not be there. And they could also say, well, <laughs> we don't need you anymore. Right? But there's a lot of things that we're making sure we're there at. And they're not that important. But it matters that they're with, we're, we're with our family. It matters that we, we prioritize our husband and our wife. Some of you right now, you're hanging with people that have a single mind. And you can't hang with, mar you can't, single people and married people have a whole different world. And some of you are, are trying to be happily married with divorced people, talking to you about how horrible your person is, how what a drag marriage is. Can't hang out with those people. Some of you got to pick some different running buddies because it's in their attitude is becoming your attitude. Their priorities are becoming your priorities, and they're not God-given priorities. You need the presence. That's why you got to get yourself just before the Lord, before you go into work. Because, listen, there's people that have their own ideas and their own plans. You wouldn't believe how many people in this, people, in this community are so miserable. They make it look like it's wonderful. They make it look like a thing to be proud about. It's not proud. Love is not proud. Love is not proud. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness but when right and truth prevail. And you say, well, what is righteousness? Everything that God says in here. Well, I don't know. You gotta look. You have a responsibility. The church's responsibility is to know the will of God. Nobody gets off the hook. We've had an American mentality where it's like you just come into the little drive through they're gonna hand you the bag on Sunday morning, and then you can get it, eat it, and then run on. This is not McDonald's. And I certainly ain't loving that. And this is not Burger King. You aren't having it your way. It's Jesus. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Woo! Rabba Hey! Show me your way, Lord, that I may know you. I know I got to quit. Show me your way that I may know you. I want you to stand with me because it helps. Show me. You're right. I want everybody to get quiet. Get quiet. Don't get too rowdy. I'm telling you, there's something holy happening here. There's something. Don't you dismiss it. Don't act like we're done. We're not done yet. 
There's something holy happening. And listen, all you have to do is yield. Close your eyes and yield to the Lord. You've heard enough this morning to say, Lord, you're holy, and I want to recognize you above others. Some of you in this place, it, you would be honest. You say, Nathaniel, I'm not where I, I was with the Lord. I can tell you right now, me personally, I am not satisfied with where I'm at. I know there's more. And I'm not going to stop right here. One of my biggest thing is, I like to go. And it's time to slow. Slow down. Sit down. Sit. Wait. Church, we're not going to be sorry for waiting. We're not going to be sorry for sitting at his feet. I'm telling you what, the, we could have a prayer line right now and pray for all the stuff you want to pray for, but I'm telling you what, this is the answer. One thing is needed, Mary, and I'm not taking it away from you. That good part. There's other parts, but this is the part that Jesus says, I'm not going to take it away from anybody. God's going to give you answers, and he's going to give you strategies. How long is it going to take? I don't know, but he's worth the waiting. worth the exclusivity. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, I don't understand all this. Like when Lauren happened, <laughs> nobody else was happy. <laughs> I'm comparing it to God. I'm not talking about the natural right now. I'm comparing something. It's like when Lauren, when I knew going to be sorry. I don't know how that's going to get fixed. I don't know how the way is going to be made. I don't know if the money's going to come in or if God's going to take you into something totally new. All I know is he'll do it again. All I know is if you'll trust in him, if you'll rest in him, he'll make a way. You're going to have to surrender this morning. There's some people in this room. You have to surrender the answers you want to have. You're going to have to surrender the strategy that you think is so wonderful. I can see some people in this room. You're at your whiteboard with all your strategies. And you want God to just come down and bless everything you've drawn and come up with. And God's not going to even use your whiteboard. <laughs> Because for number one, all of his good stuff wouldn't fit on there. <laughs> He's going to do beyond what you could ask or think. So the Lord would say to you today, church, will you come and bring to me what's in your hand so I can give to you what's in my hand? I'm telling you, I don't care what you need. I tell you, He's what you need. He's what you need. Come on, church, we got an invitation today to respond to the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm answering my own altar call. I'm answering my own call. He's the one I want to sit at his feet. He's the one that satisfies me. If you say, Nathaniel, I want to come back to Jesus only. I want to come back to the one thing. You're not, not that you don't love Jesus. It's just say, you say, Nathaniel, I see the priority of his presence. I see the value of his word, and I want to value him more. I want him to give me the fear of the Lord. I want you to come. I want you to come, just you and the Lord. Nobody's going to ask anything. Just say, I want to fear the Lord, Nathaniel. I want to come under his word like never before. If that's you and you want to come, you feel the Lord drawing. I tell you, something's going to break off of you today. This deception is going to break. This addiction is going to break. This addiction to the people. This addiction to the praises of men. Lord, break it off of us today. Break it off of us today. Lord, we want to sit at your feet. We want to be lovers your presence. I'm standing here in need of prayer. I'm saying, Lord, rend my heart. Lord, cause me to love what you love and hate what you hate. Some of you have been fighting for your values, fighting for what you believe in. But what you believe in doesn't align up with the Word of God. But God, I have these desires. But God can change your desires. God is God above your desires. Come submit your desires to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I see that your way is different than my desires. Break it off of me. Take this from me. Father, fill the hungry souls. Come on, there's people hungry right now. 
I need some of our prayer people to just just agree with me today. Jesus has set you free. Jesus is pulling you out. Jesus is pulling you out. I wanted to pray for somebody's marriage online. You say, God, I need help. I need help, God. I thank you for sending help from your sanctuary to their marriage. Lord, they just wonder how in the world will this be fixed. God, unite their heart to fear your name, but also restore their hearts to one another, God. I just think that divorce is not an option. That that's not where this is going. That Jesus, you interrupt. You give a holy disruption this morning to these marriages. And you disrupt every strategy of the enemy. There's people in this room. The enemy's been coming after your marriage. And in the name of Jesus, we come against you, devil. You're a loser. You're a liar. We're going to not let petty things tear us apart. Honey, wife, you're that intercessor for your husband. If you don't pray for him, who will? He doesn't need you to cry. He needs you to pray him through. I wouldn't be here if Lauren didn't pray me through. She prayed me through. She believed for me. Sometimes you have to believe for them because they don't have any faith. 